Hello, this is Mark again, and we're continuing in our series on biblical theology, systematic theology, what the Bible as a whole has to say about um, various topics. Now, we just completed a series on the Word of God, and we're transitioning today to a study of theology proper, and that is the study of God. And I'm um, excited about this because obviously the Lord God is the centerpiece of all theology. And in fact, that, that is what the definition of theology is, um, words about God or the, the study of God. And um, so um, in this day and age in any age really, but particularly in our own. In my opinion, I really do believe that, um, I believe it was Tozer who wrote the book, uh, Your God is Too Small. And uh, we need to recapture a biblical view of the grandeur of a God. And that is my goal in this series, is to, to grasp the incomparable greatness of the biblical God. And there is something about the doctrine of God that affects every other doctrine. It really does. Um, you run the gamut from A to Z, and your doctrine of God will have a direct impact and influence on uh, your understanding of that particular doctrine. So we're going to take our time going through this uh, study of the doctrine of God. And, you know, I do this uh, also with, with a sense of fear and trembling because who can, who can do this with, with adequacy? But I'm also very excited. So um, having done a study on the sufficiency of Scripture last time, where it's customary for theologians in their first um, session on the doctrine of God to talk about his incomprehensibility. And that may sound kind of um, ironic or contradictory uh, to begin a series on the study of the doctrine of God by discussing his incomprehensibility, because like, if he's incomprehensible, incomprehensible, then we, what else is there to say about them? But the, because um, well, the, the, the street definition of being incomprehensible means not comprehensible, not comprehensible, or non-intelligible, or non-understandable. But the technical or narrow um, theological definition of incomprehensibility of God is this, and that is that um, that because of the creature creator distinction, um, we will never have an exhaustive knowledge of God. We can have a true knowledge of Him, but we'll never have an exhaustive knowledge of Him. Now we'll go into more detail about that, but it just means that there are limits to our knowledge of God. We don't worship an unknown God like Paul was talking about in Acts 17. God has graciously revealed to us very many things about himself. But there's some things he hasn't revealed. And um, we'll deal with that. So it is appropriate to begin with the incomprehensibility of God just to remind us that God has set limits on, for a couple of reasons, as we'll see, as to um, our inability to be able to understand him fully. And there's actually a, a very comforting beauty in that, because what it really boils down to, the incomprehensibility, is the godishness of God. Okay? So... When we talk again about the incomprehensibility of God, we do not mean that he's unknowable. Um, 
we're talking about the goddishness of God and the distance between the transcendent creator and his creatures, namely us. Now, I'm going to um, give an example of this by turn to, to Romans chapter 1. And I want to show you Paul as an inspired systematic theologian doing inspired systematic theology. Um, he do, he's, it's not a comprehensive systematic in Romans. Um, there are certain things he, he leaves out by, by God's, you know, wise sovereignty. But nevertheless, there are, as you know, in the book of Romans, this is, it's a pretty um, rich, detailed discussion of, of um, doctrine in the book of Romans. So I want us to look at that real quickly and then see how Paul comes to his summary. And so that we'll kind of get a, a biblical understanding of what the incomprehensibility of, of God means and what it doesn't mean. If you look at chapter 1 of Romans, it's a discussion of Paul's calling to be an apostle and then his longing to go to Rome. Then you have the thematic statement, verses 16 and 17, about not being ashamed of the gospel and that the righteousness of God is revealed by faith. The rest of chapter 1 is uh, has to do with general revelation and how that leaves um, people in the state of damnation, um, that God's wrath is being poured out because of man's universal rejection or suppression of that knowledge. In chapter 2, we have God's righteous judgment um, a, against both the uh, pagan and the Jews. In chapter 3, we have again um, a um, punishing, relentless argument um, about the total despoilment or depravity of, of man and that no one is righteous, no not one, that we are all sinners, we all fall short of God's glory. Then the um, we have the beauty of the righteousness of God that comes through faith uh, starting at verse 21 and then the most detailed discussion of justification by faith alone in the Bible uh, in chapters 3 and 4. And then chapter 5, uh, again, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we have Paul systematically dealing with the doctrine of, of um, the uh, perseverance of the saints. You know, if God, if we've been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by the wrath of God? Then the second half of chapter 5, he compares um, death and Adam with our life in Christ, the first and second Adam. Chapter 6 is a um, rich discussion of our union with Christ. Chapter 7 is an agonizing autobiographical discussion or um, testimony to Paul's remaining struggle with indwelling sin. Um, at some point in this series, I'll defend that interpretation of Romans 7. Chapter 8 is a uh, very, very rich um summation of life in the spirit, the future glory, uh, glorification for uh, not just human beings, but cosmically as well for the creation. God's everlasting love, chapter 9, God's sovereign choice, election, predestination, everybody's favorite topic. Um, by the way, every Christian believes in predestination or election or chosen by God because the word is in the Bible. It's just there's a radical difference in um, definition of the word, right? Uh, then chapter 10, 
there's a discussion of the necessity and the centrality of the preaching of the Word of God for people to hear it. Chapter 11, Paul, ever the, the Jew in the back of his mind and in his heart, even though he's an apostle to the Gentile, discusses the um, future for ethnic Israel. And he, um, in my understanding of chapter 11, he's talking about how at the end, before Christ, right before Christ comes back, that there will be a, um, a mighty work of the Holy Spirit amongst ethnic Israel. The church is the true Israel. So in the Bible, uh, it uses Jews and Israel in more than one sense. But as far as um, ethnic Israel, they are actually mentioned, and uh, uh, God does have a plan for them. But we need to, we need to capture the fact that we are the apple of God's eye. We're His chosen people now. Uh, we are the true Jews, as it says in Romans 4. All right, so after all of that, uh, that's just a quick reconnaissance of Romans 1 through 11. Um, we come to verse 21, chapter 11. Says, so they too now have been disobedient in order by the mercy shown to you that they may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. That's the verse I wanted to get to. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. And now quoting from Isaiah and Job. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So after all this systematic inspired theology, Paul comes to the end of his linguistic rope, so to speak, and just sets forth the incomprehensibility of God, his inscrutableness. There is, he just breaks forth into praise. God's wisdom and his ways are just far beyond our understanding. And hence he deserves all the glory. And as I heard early on in my seminary experience, um, I went two years at Covenant Seminary uh, in St. Louis, I understand a little bit why I love the covenants. No, I'm just kidding. It's... And then uh, the third year from a master of divinity um, at Erskine. But he shows us um, where true theology should always lead, and that's to doxology, because that's what he, he does in verse um, 36. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. But you'll see that even after all of the things that Paul goes into depth about, and I'm sure in my own mind that it's probably Romans that Peter had in mind when he said in, in 2 Peter uh, 3.15, you know, some things that Paul are a little difficult to understand. Probably what we just went through that he was thinking about, at least in part. But it was, it was the inspired Paul himself who, after talking about all the knowability of God, adds to that the proviso. We have to remember that every, after everything is said and done, there is an hidden aspect of God, an inscrutability to God and his ways that... Um, Praise his holy name. He has revealed many, many, many truths about himself and his uh, his person and his work, uh, especially about Christ. But in the end, there's many things about him that are unsearchable and his ways are inscrutable. So 
that's using the Bible's words and, uh, itself, to, and hopefully that helped to explain. Um, and of course, there's the text in Isaiah 55. Um, and let me quote from that. Um, verses, let's see here. Verse uh, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So there we have a, a biblical expression of what we're calling the incomprehensibility of God. Again, it doesn't mean his un He's unknowable. It just means that we can have apprehensive knowledge of God, but we cannot have comprehensive knowledge of God. We can apprehend and know God truly, but we cannot comprehend him exhaustively. Um, neither here nor in eternity. When we're in heaven and glorified, we will not be deified. And one billion years from now, we'll still be learning about God. <laughs> There'll never be a point where we can say that we know God exhaustively. Never. Because in order to be able to say God that we know God fully, comprehensively, and exhaustively, we would have to be God himself. Only God knows God comprehensively. Only Father, the Father knows the Son comprehensively, and the Son, the Spirit, and, and so forth. We will never, we will continue, and that will be one of the most beautiful things about heaven, is the fact that we'll continue to learn, and we'll be in the greatest seminary in the universe, in the presence of God himself. Um, listen to Paul preach, and Isaiah preach, and... Um, Hopefully the Lord Jesus himself preach. So, again, we'll be glorified but not deified. There is a phrase in Latin that I like. It's finitum non, com finitum non, non capax infinitum. Finitum non capax infinitum, which means a finite cannot grasp the infinite. The medieval theologians came up with that, and it's good. It, it just simply means the finite cannot grasp the infinite. And um, there's, uh, there's two reasons, just essentially, why we uh, our knowledge of God is um, uh, limited and... Um, that God, that our knowledge of Him is uh, that, that there is a incomprehensible aspect to it, and that is because um, first reason is that He is infinite and eternal, and we are finite and temporal. Therefore, the categories of our minds. The, the, the categories by which we process reality and the information that comes to us, these categories are finite. And we're also creatures of tempor temporal creatures. We will live forever because God has decreed it so. But only God is by nature uh, immortal. And, and we'll, like I said, we, we shall live forever as eternal creatures because God has decreed for us to so. It's not because there's some substance in us like the soul that is um, in and of itself intrinsically immortal. That's a Platonic notion. We live forever because God decrees that it will be so. But it's just the, our finitude, our finiteness is a limit to our ability to be able to understand the infinite. And that's something that's not sinful, as the neo-Orthodox theologians tended to, to say. Um, they're wrong on many fronts, people like Karl Barth and Brunner and others. And God knows that we're finite, and 
Jesus experienced finitude. And so just the fact that we are finite and that God is infinite, um, he's eternal and we're temporal, those two things are going to necessitate that our knowledge of God is going to contain uh, elements of incomprehensibility. Now, at the heart of that incomprehensibility is God's transcendence. That means, you know, that God is, he is the creator and that we are the creature. It's very important that we grasp that, particularly in our day, the transcendence of God. So there's two poles of the Lord's um, nature, his transcendence and his imminence. His transcendence is his um, otherness, his, um, the fact that he is uh, other than, he's God, he's a creator, we're the creature. And um, he's infinitely um, above us. But then his eminence means that he is um, with us, close by virtue of the fact that he upholds the universe. He's covenantally related to us. Um, the Holy Spirit indwells those who know the Lord by virtue of our union with Christ. But the reason why I'm saying it's especially important for us in our day and age is because the, the, the number one enemy of the church today is not secularism, it's not materialism, and it's certainly not atheism. Those things have been and always will be issues that we need to deal with. But far and away, the worldview that is um, the biggest enemy of Christianity is paganism, New Age, neo Gnosticism goes by many different names. I prefer paganism, and um, Peter Jones has written a book called The Other Worldview, and I would recommend that very highly because it's um, it's a very sane um, and but in-depth look at um, at the various components of the pagan worldview and the implications for um, you know what what pagan belief is and how it's affecting our culture. Uh, he's not from America, so when he came back over here, he was really shocked with how paganized our nation had come become rather. Um, in just a, a, a couple of decades. But one of the things that's confusing about paganism is that there are countless varieties of paganism or New Age, just countless. And so that can get people befuddled and confused um, when they're studying it because there's you got the Buddhist thing going on, you got got... Um, you know, wicked going on, uh, you got everything, just, they're just, like I said, they're countless. And each one has its own distinctive features and beliefs and practices and so on. But the hallmark, the chief characteristic of every single one, um, Every, every manifestation of paganism is distinguished by this one fact, and that is its denial of the creator-creature distinction. Okay? Now, at the very heart of biblical theology, at the very heart of the Word of God's teaching about the nature of God, is this distinction between the creator and the creature. I mean, it's exceedingly basic knowledge, but it's at that very point where the devil is attacking most ferociously today. Again, you can take 
the countless cafeteria list of, and that's what it's like. You're going through a cafeteria. I, I picked this. I want that. I want that. Out of the pagan cafeteria. But again, in the bewildering array of, of pagan beliefs, they all share that one thing, the denial of the fact that there is a distinction between the creator and the creature. They are conf conflated. The creature is the creator. The creator is the creature. Uh, God is the um, is the creation. Creation is God. Um, pantheism, or sometimes pantheism, is just um, it's just a mess where you know spark a divine and all of us that type thing but it's it's the it's what's going on in romans 1 25 and 28 um where paul says that uh, they exchanged the truth of god for the lie and the definite article is there the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. In other words, they deny the creator-creature distinction. They deny the incomprehensibility of God. Okay, because God to, in paganism is totally imminent. There's no transcendence to God, not in the biblical sense. Okay, so again, we were talking about the first reason why God is incomprehensible is just because He's infinite, we're finite, he's eternal, we're temporal. The second reason why God is incomprehensible is because he himself has set limits on what he has revealed about himself in his infinite wisdom. He's done that. Remember we quoted from Deuteronomy 29, 29? Well, it's very appropriate again uh, in this discussion as well. It's amazing how much that uh, text uh, can apply to different uh, topics. Um, let me get to it. Um, Deuteronomy 29, 29. It talks, you know, there's, as Luther taught, taught about the reveal, revealed God and the hidden God. The secret, th the secret things belong to the Lord our God but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the works of this law so we know from last time study that God has given us all the divine words we need to live a life of godliness in Christ Jesus. So the incomprehensibility of God is not a limitation on, on us in any way. If anything, it's a prod to, as we'll see when we apply this, to worship. And... Um, but the point I was making there is simply that God, one of the second reason why God is incomprehensible is because he, in his infinite wisdom, has not revealed everything about himself. He is um, held back from in revealing certain things about who he is and what he's done as far as explaining think of Romans 9 um, you know he finally comes to the point and says stop asking it's like potter clay asking the potter what are you doing and um, we'll get to that it's all about election but that's the second reason for the incomprehensibility of the fact is comprehensibility is, is the fact that God himself is set limits on how much he desired to reveal about himself. I wanted to read to you from uh, uh, one of my favorite guys, John Frame. Um, this, this is a little uh, bit of, um, well, he's talking about God's knowledge and our knowledge. So let me just read a little bit of it. Um, contrasting his knowledge and ours. God's knowledge is original. Our knowledge is derivative from his. 
God's knowledge is exhaustive, ours is limited. God's knowledge serves as the ultimate criterion of truth and right. Our knowledge must observe those standards. God never needs information or illumination from outside himself. We cannot know anything without the help of God and our experience of the world outside ourselves. God knows what he knows without process, simply by being what he is. His knowledge has sometimes been described as an eternal intuition, but our knowledge often requires hard efforts to accumulate facts and to figure out logical deductions. God's knowledge of the facts of creation precedes the existence of these facts, but the facts precede our knowledge of them. God's interpretation of the facts precedes the existence of the facts. Our interpretation is a reinterpretation of God's prior interpretation. So, the facts of our experience are not brute or uninterpreted facts, as if the human interpretation were the first. Rather, the facts are already interpreted before we come to know them. And God's interpretation is a normative interpretation that should govern ours. To summarize, God's knowledge is divine with all of God's attributes. Our knowledge is creaturely with all the attributes of creatureliness. As God's image, human beings have a knowledge that reflects God's in many ways, but it is by no means identical with it, that is, with God's knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Frame. So, when we are, for example, talking about God's attributes and uh, segments to come, his omniscience, his omnipotence, and justice, mercy, and so on, even those things, as much as we know about them, there will still be an element of incomprehensibility. We won't Obviously, we can't and don't um, know them exhaustively. But, you know, it's like, do you know anybody exhaustively, even on a human level? Think of the person you love the most. Okay, your son or daughter or your, your lover, your husband or wife, whatever. Do you know them exhaustively? No. no you know, may know them very, very well. You may be naked and unashamed with them and know them in the biblical sense, but you don't know them exhaustively. They don't know you exhaustively. And that's one of the deepest longings of the human heart is to know, to be known, and to know in a secure covenant relationship. But even still, that's not exhaustive knowledge. So you take that, multiply it by infinity, and so you have the issue then with God. Um, God's speech to us is very like, very much like our speech to each other. It's personal speech, and our knowledge of Him is personal knowledge, just like it like it is of our our loved ones. But it, we're, our knowledge of Him is of an infinite being, but He's personal. He's the personal being. Uh, any person, post personalness that we have is derivative from him. So, again, even though our knowledge of God is not exhaustive, it's true. You know, it's like when I go see my three-year-old grandson, I get down on my knees and I talk like a, you know, baby talk, a three-year-old talk to him. And... Um, what I'm saying to him is true, but it's down on a real, real low level. And that's the way God is in his communication via scripture. Is It's like, um, you know, a mom talking to her little child, lisping, as Calvin said. It's the, the knowledge that we have of God is, is um, just not exhaustive, but it's true. The knowledge that we have of God is very, very rich in what we know about Him, 
particularly the personal work of Christ. There's a whole lot that we know. But there's how much do we not know? That's one of the mysteries. But when it talks about God and our we've got we have, and our knowledge of him, we have to remember that's at the heart of theology. If theology is anything, it's our knowledge of God. Um, that the knowledge that we learn about God should lead to knowledge of God. You know, this shouldn't just be um, things bouncing around in our head, knowledge about God, um, that leads to nothing else. The knowledge about God should lead to knowledge of God. Now, you can't have knowledge of God without knowledge about God. Okay, so that's where the riches of deep theology help and where people are, are misunderstanding they don't see the connection between loving god and knowledge about him you know um if you want if you are in love with someone you want to know everything you can about them and so that's the ultimate purpose of this series and systematic theology is to help us to grow in our love for the Lord, our purpose in life is to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, you know, the Bible, in a very real way, equates knowledge of God with salvation. I think of John 17, 3. It says, this is eternal life, to know you, the, o the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So, eternal life begins here, and it's personal knowledge of God. And I think also John 1.18, where it speaks of uh, Jesus G revealing the Father, uh, or to use a te uh, theological phrase, he exegetes the Father. Um, he expresses to us in a comprehensible way comprehensible way who the father is so um, even though we're talking about the incomprehensibility of God let us not forget that salvation itself is understood in terms of knowing God um, so how do we apply this? Uh, I've thought about this, y'all, how we apply the incompre incomprehensibility of God. And I would just ask you to, to think for yourself how this might help you in the, your circumstances. But I think of John Piper's phrase that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. My passion is that we might develop a God-centered theology and not a man-centered theology, a theocentric theology and not an anthropocentric theology. Um, because even in evangelical cir uh, circles, so much of the sermonizing is anthropocentric, man-centered, psychologizing, moralizing, that sort of stuff. And we need to recapture God-centered, God-saturated, um, God-fixated, theocentric, preaching and teaching and understanding of God. Our God is too small, and that is the greatest need uh, of our generation, is to have a deeper, um, greater understanding of God's in, incomparable greatness. And that will affect, like I said, everything else that we understand about Scripture. Um, so that's first application is that, um, I mean, it's, it's sad for me to say, I don't like to, to um, I mean, there's many fine preachers out there, 
so I don't know what the percentage is. All I know is that a lot of the books coming out today um, and a lot of the preaching out, out there today, especially on t uh, television, is awful. The vast majority of that is just uh, heretical, actually. But if, if it's evangelical, it's still... Still uh, has a lot of um, man-centered uh, aspects to it, and um, I would just love to see a recapturing of a God-besotted, God-intoxicated people. And Piper reminds us that it's when we are most caught up in a grasp of God's glory that we are most satisfied. And when we are most satisfied and content and happy in God, that's when God is most glorified in us. That's why the Shorter Catechism says that um, our purpose in life is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So I love that balance there. Um, and uh, I think he shows how that we do, how that can be accomplished. Is that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. So um, another application of God's incomprehensibility is it should lead to humility. It certainly did with Job, but it reminds us of the fact that um, we are not the definers of our own reality, and. Uh, in a sense, I'm glad to be getting away from the paranormal thing, but, you know, it, it was something I was reminded of for year after year, and that is, it, I was astonished at how quickly people were not looking to God's Word to define reality. Uh, instead, they, they were looking to the categories of their own mind. They were doing what is very foolish and... Um, I, I would say, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, um, well, it just wasn't very, very wise to try to define entities, um, by virtue of the way that they appear. Um, I'm still in trouble. Can't find that word I'm looking for, but... It's the eluding me. It's incomprehensible to me at the moment. <laughs> but, yeah, that's... Uh, in, God has already interpreted every fact in the world, and it's up to us to reinterpret it according to His Word. So, humility. A deep awe and wonder before God's incomprehensibility. Um... I think of John's experience of seeing Christ both as a lamb and as a lion and the multifaceted nature of the atonement. It should also lead to, and this is closely connected, a reverent worship of God. Uh, as Paul himself showed that after he had laid out all the specifics of the drama of redemption from in Romans 1 through 11, his, it led, that theology um, led to doxology. And all good, proper, sound theology should lead to doxology or praise. And then lastly, as far as application, the we come, we come across mysteries in our life all the time, difficult circumstances. We pray to God for wisdom. We pray for uh, healing, guidance, discernment, and the fact that, and then very often life seems obtuse or incomprehensible to us. And... Just let it sink into your mind that God's incomprehensibility is a comforting thing. It brings out the godish 
likeness of God. That he is, whatever your trials are, God is our ultimate circumstance or situation. It's, it's not your trial. It's God. That's how very real his presence is with us. His, he is our ultimate circumstance. So that doesn't diminish the, the, the fact of whatever it is you might be going through now. But just please remember that our God is so incomparably great. You may not understand, I may not understand why he's not answering my prayer the way that I would like for him to. But to use a well-worn analogy, but a good one, is, and that is the fact that we're looking at the back side of a tapestry. And we can see some elements of um, design on the back side of that mosaic of the tapestry amongst the frayed um, pieces of um, the um, fabric. But God sees the front end and he is a master weaver with his wisdom and his gentle hands and his love. So that's a realistic understanding is that um, uh, contrary to, uh, to the health and wealth heresy, we will experience um, sickness and uh, uh, we will all die unless Jesus comes back. But the point is, is that God will be with us in whatever our trials are. And if we, if we can't understand them, it might be because of the fact that God is so much bigger than we are. But just because we can't understand what's going on in our life doesn't mean that God is not in control. He is. Father, I pray that you would take this beautiful doctrine and like Paul applied it, we worship you and we praise your name. You are after all, incomprehensible. You're the creator and we're creatures. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as the reformer said, soli deo gloria. To God alone be the glory. Amen.